Thanks, Ron. Um, uh, it's a great honor for me to talk at, uh, at this conference. Uh, it's a subject, string math is a subject that's near and dear to my heart. Um, and it's a great pleasure to be able to do so among friends. Um, this talk will be about joint work with Vivek Shenda and David Truman. Um, OK, so you know those, you, you write a long email and you rant about your uh, coworkers and stuff. And uh, it's too long, you know they're not going to read it. So you write too long to read, and then you just uh, do a wrap up uh, in one line. So this talk, if it's too long to read or too long to listen, here's what I'll do. It's a, the input will be a Legendrian uh, submanifold or even or subvariety. And I'm going to produce a category from it. And sometimes we would uh, conjecture that this is a Legendrian contact homology uh, category. There's a way to build a category out of Legendrian contact homology. But if you don't, if, um, if you don't want to think about that, um, the main point is an application where we start with a braid closure a knot or a link. Then we produce this, uh, let's call it lambda. We produce this category, C lambda. And from that category, there's some interesting moduli spaces of objects. That one can construct. And from those moduli spaces of objects, um, using technology of uh, Ben Webster and Jordy Williamson, we can construct a uh, full Humphrey Kovana Brzezanski three variable uh, not invariant. One weird thing to say is it's a Legendrian knot, but we're constructing the, uh, the invariant is just a top invariant of. Uh, topological knots. OK, so that's what's going to happen here. Uh, and if that interests you, great. Uh, if, uh, and I don't know what I can do if it doesn't. Um, all right. So I've given many talks where I have the main example that I want to tell the audience. And you develop the background and the motivation. Then you never get to the example. Or you have to rush through it. So I'm going to start this with the example. Start with the main example of this general construction, which produces a category. Namely, I'm going to, do, I'm going to start with a, um, some sort of diagram of a Legendrian knot. OK. So I'm going to live inside R3 um, or R2 cross S1. And I'm going to have R3 with its standard context structure. So the context of Legendrians involves contact manifold. And contact manifold has a one form uh, which has some non degeneracy conditions. And a um, submanifold is Legendrian if this one form vanishes on it. And in, in R3 or R2 mud, oh, so this, uh, or R2 cross S1, this is the same uh, form descended to this quotient where we identify x and x plus 1. Okay, so that's the background geometry. And we imagine a knot there in R3. And we project it, because three dimensions is too, too many to draw, into what's called the front projection. 
Okay, so those two, just ignore y. Okay, and when you draw front projection, I'll, I'll do an example. So here's one. Okay, there's a picture. Um, or uh, this is a braid closure. So here's the braid, um, and a, a braiding of two strands, and I'm closing it up that way. It's easier to close up a braid in this geometry because you can just go identify the two ends. Okay, so those are two uh, closures of the two three braid. Now, this is a projection of a Legendrian. The fact that it's Legendrian means that c equals zero. So, solving for y, y equals dz dx. Okay, so the third coordinate is completely determined from this projection by the slope. So that's Legendrian geometry for you. And the cusps are actually smooth. I'll give you a local model of the cusp. Um, the cusp, a uh, local model of this, it looks uh, singular in the projection, but it's smooth in three space. So t squared, roughly t squared t, t cubed. That's a smooth embedding of, of an arc in, into three space. You can see that uh, z is equal to x to the 3 halves. And dz dx is like x to the 1 half, up to, up to a constant. That's good. That's Legendrian geometry. I mean, that's contact uh, uh, geometry on R3. And uh, we study knots by looking at their image under the front projection. Also note one thing about these braids that we're going to consider is that all the crossings are over crossings. So happily, I don't have to worry about you know, erasing, erasing little pieces of it. Okay? Y is dz dx, so this y is bigger than that y, because this is positive and that's negative. So I said I'm going to construct from uh, this information a category. And I'm just going to describe for you the category. And then if you're still awake after half hour and I've, I've done the application, um, then I'll, I'll give you the background for how, how to construct that category. So lambda is going to be our, uh, our not, our front, uh, our, our not, and it's going to have a front projection. And the category will be a category of locally constant sheaves on R2, this is she's a vector spaces. So locally constant just means that there are vector spaces over uh, regions. Uh, I'll specify more precisely an R2 or that's an or R cross S1 described by. Okay, so we have a picture of our knot. And I need to des describe from that a category. It's almost going to be like a, a quiver category. We have some discrete data. A vector space, um, by the way, when I, in this talk, basically, when I say vector space, I mean complex of vector spaces. When I say isomorphism, I mean, I mean quasi-isomorphism. And uh, that's, that's that. A vector space for each. Uh, region and uh, zero, the zero vector space or the zero uh, acyclic complex um, outside the picture or below uh, the diagram. Okay? So in these pictures here, I mean zero out here and I mean zero down here. But can fill in with vector spaces here. I need to tell you how they interact. Otherwise, it's just a direct sum of vector space. OK. A map uh, upwards across each arc. So locally in the region, I'll have an arc. I'll have a vector space down here, a vector space up here, and a map, say f, upwards across the arc. OK. 
Okay. I have to tell you what happens at a cusp. A cusp, I'm going to have V, W, and there's V up here. Again, I have a map this way, I have a map this way, and I have something which is identity or homotopic to the identity uh, from V to V. That's the local data at a cusp and the local data at a crossing. So, so far, this is pretty much the same as a quiver with relations, or it can be encoded in a quiver with relations, but it is going to be something different at a crossing, which is where, all, which is where the fun happens. Um, a, B, C, D, map this way, upward across the arc, upward across the arc, up, upward across the arc, like that, such that that uh, diagram commutes. And the uh, total complex is acyclic. So there's no cohomology in the total complex. And the total complex is this one here, A to B plus C to D. This, as we'll see, is not exactly quiver with relation stuff. Uh, it was sort of quiver with uh, relations that have an inequality kind of uh, thing. Okay. All right, so that's that. Um, let me give you an example, a uh, sub-example. This is all part of the main application of the, of the theory. Okay. Here's the unknot. No crossings. What do we have? We have zero out here. We have a uh, vector space here. B, there's no choice. Of maps to make here. So we have that, that just a vector space. So for this example, the category is the category of vector spaces or chain complexes, because I think I said each vector space is actually a chain complex. OK, let me do another example. Um, okay. If you recognize that, uh, that uh, this not don't tell. Um, let's call this one, this one I called lambda, I guess. Let's call this one lambda twiddle. Um, I have a vector space V, another vector space W. This is V up here, this is V down here as well. So I have V and two maps to W, A, B. But I also have a map, right? I have this map here, A, this map here, B. I have this map here, P, back to V, like that. What are the relations? Uh, what did I say? There's a cusp here which says that A and P is the identity. So P A is the identity on V. Um, P B is the identity. And something else. There's one crossing there. What does the crossing say? The crossing condition. What does it say? I have zero down here. Zero, uh, v plus v, and then mapping by a and b into w, and then this is acyclic. In other words, uh, this is an isomorphism, and so this determines. Um, this determines. The isomor isomorphism W is V plus V. So W is actually determined by V through A and B. And there's no more information than just V. And these categories, lambda twiddle and lambda, are actually the same. C lambda and C lambda twiddle are the same. The reason for that is. That what I've done here, oh, sorry. Wait, I don't know. Can I? There are techniques for pointing places you can't reach. But I, I don't know how to. Anyway, um, what I've uh, done here, here is I've taken that and I've put this. And topologically, this is just this Reitermeister 1 twist. I haven't changed the knot topologically. 
Uh, and this is one of the Lagrangian Reitermeister moves. And, and so it should, if I'm going to construct any kind of uh, Lagrangian invariant, uh, invariant of Lagrangian knots, it better be invariant under this. And so this is the first demonstration of that. OK, but that's sort of looking at. Sorry? Yes, but you can have isotopic knots, topological isotopic knots that are not Legendrian isotopic. Yeah, so Chekhanov, there's a che pair of knots discovered by Chekhanov, which satisfy this. But um, yeah, so this, is, this, this category is going to be an invariant of Legendrian knots. But one of the things that it constructs, you know, we didn't know how strong is this category. Well, it's got these moduli spaces, and we can construct these things out of it. So it's at least that strong. Okay. OK, what else to say about this category? Uh, there's, a interesting, there's some interesting things. There's a, um, there's a boundary uh, functor. Forget that word if you don't like it. Which takes you from the knot to this category to local systems uh, on, the, on the knot. The knot is, of course, uh, well, if it's, a, if it's a knot, it's just S1. Uh, or if it's a link, it's S1 to the number of components. So what does that look like? So if I have an object of this category, um, let me describe what the local system is over a region of the knot. So this, uh, let me describe it over just a piece of an arc. An arc would be described by a map between two vector spaces. Sorry, that's an F. And on that arc, this equals um, the cone of this map. If you don't like the words cone, uh, this is, is uh, think of it as W mod V. If the map is an injection, I just mean W mod V. If the map is a surjection, I just mean the kernel, maybe shifted. So that. Um, so that's a vector space, and that you carry that along. Where's the picture? You carry that along. When you hit a crossing, luckily you can actually carry it across the crossing. So this condition that the, the total complex here is acyclic means precisely that the cone of this map is isomorphic to the cone of that map, which means that this vector space that I'm carrying along this arc, I can carry it across the crossing. It also means that the cone of this map, by this morphism, is isomorphic to the cone of that map, which means that the vector space that I had been carrying this way gets carried across the R. And you can do a similar thing at cusps. Yeah, I'm, I'm lying a little bit. There's a, there's a shift here relating to uh, a grading on the, on, the, on the strands, but probably not worth discussing on the first pass. OK. Is everybody, no, maybe not everybody's with me, is born this bright shirt that should help keep you awake. Uh, any questions? There's a knot, there's a picture, there's a category. What are the, what, sorry? The three, uh, that comes later. I haven't, I haven't described to you. But that's entirely in, contained within this work, but I'll mention it when I get there. So, yeah, I'm, where am I? I'm sort of up to here in this program. Question? Yes. Yes. We don't see that in the do we? Where? Here, no, no, no. Importantly, we don't actually, because this knot has, these local systems are somehow associated to the filling surface, and this one, the filling surface is contractible. OK. Uh, well, there's more. There's more, but I'm almost, almost done. Uh, to tell you about the, these moduli spaces. In the R2 cross S1 case, we have another map, uh, which is uh, the restriction to the top of cylinder, to the top. So you can restrict it, your sheaf to this top region.
And that, whoops, that gives us a map from our category to local systems on uh, the, just that top region, uh, which is just S1. So local system on S1 is just a, just a I like it. What can I do now? Yes, right of Meister, one. OK, good, thanks. Um, right, so I could restrict my uh, locally constant sheaf to the top uh, of a cylinder. I get a locally constant sheaf on uh, S1, okay. which is just a group element up to conjugation. OK, now let me tell you which. Uh, so I've, I've described for you this category. Let me tell you uh, which moduli spaces I'm interested in this category. Moduli spaces of interest. Um, M, I'll just call it M. This is a silly notation, but I can get it on the board fast. Uh, okay. So I'm interested in those objects. Uh, whose um, local system along the knot is rank one. Okay. There was this cone. So this is, this, if this is to be rank one, that means the dimension of W has to be one bigger than the dimension of V. So let's take a look at what those uh, moduli spaces might look like. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be looking at in uh, local systems in degree zero. Yeah. I mean, I could have shifted everything. Okay. So let's look at. Um, I want to look at this moduli space M, and I'm going to look at slices. Of M, so I'm going to be interested in this uh, these moduli spaces for braid closures, and for braid closures, the vertical slices look look nice. Okay, so slices of M. So um, for the purposes of the example, I'll take the R2 cross S1 geometry, and so I have some braid closure, and in between. I have some number of strands. Okay. And then I have something else happening. And so I'm going to look at the moduli space just uh, of the local choices around, uh, around here. The fact that these are sheaves, everything is actually local. So uh, a local um, understanding is going to be enough to piece together a global understanding. OK, so what are the rules of the game? In the R2 cross S1 geometry, down here I have to put zero. I have a category. There's a map from here up. That's always going to be the zero map. The cone of that map is going to be whatever this vector space is. And I require that it be one dimensional. That was the rule of the game. This moduli space is a moduli space of objects with one dimensional um, uh, cones across each arc. Here's another arc. This has to be two-dimensional. Three, four, five, so <coughs> all the way up to n. OK, so just this slice of the moduli space, whatever the full thing is for a big braid, uh, this slice, we already get something interesting. The moduli space of this slice is going to be full flags uh, on n-dimensional vector spaces, if there are n strands, uh, which you can write as g mod b where G is uh, GLN and B is the upper triangular. Okay, so that's one slice of, of our moduli space. OK. Now what's going to happen at crossings? That's, of course, 
more interesting. Um, so let's say I have some strands and then a crossing. Okay. So what is a, what is the slice of the moduli space look here? Look like here? Um, so I have you know zero at the bottom, up to let's say v i minus one, v i on the left, v i prime on the right, v i plus one. Okay. And let's say this is this s. I'm going to associate this crossing to the ith position. I'll, I'll call that si, s being thought of as a permutation or generator of the braid group or element of the vial group of GLN. Um, let's look. So let's call mu si this local uh, moduli space of this slice here. Okay, it's obtained by all these vector spaces of increasing dimension. Except on the left and right, that we could choose different vector spaces. And then after that, they have to be the same. So there are two projections down to um, moduli space of the unbraid, namely just flags. I can project to the left flag or to the right flag. That's good. And what does the crossing condition say? It says that um, this, this to this to this is an acyclic complex. And that will say that these two, the intersection of these two vector spaces, VI, is the lower one. The way to think about that, since these are flags, is just subtract I, VI minus 1 from everything. This is 0. These are one-dimensional vector spaces. This is a two-dimensional vector spaces. These two one-dimensional vector spaces uh, lie in this two-dimensional vector space. And they can't be the same one. They have to span it. And that's a, precisely the, the crossing condition. So, so the, if, if, if you don't understand this, you will understand this, 0, c, c, c squared. And then the fact that this complex has no cohomology means precisely that these two lines generate c2 in here, and I've just taken this and added vi minus 1 to that, to that picture. All right, so that's a, ah, here it is. That's an understanding of that slice of the moduli space, and that's pretty much all you need. Uh, yes, because this is a local picture, right? If I were to make global sense of that, right? There's two, two things that are different from this previous picture. Uh, one is that this vertical slice contains other arcs, and it looks a, little, a bit different. The other thing is that this whole picture has the global information that this, this region is isomorphic to that region. I haven't imposed that. These are just local. No. No, locally they're different, but then when you, when you go and say, OK, here's a local picture of the slice, and then here's another local picture. The fact that they agree over here would mean that the two would have to be isomorphic in the end. The fact that the empty moduli space is just a choice of point. Well, if you write means that they are isomorphic, but actually different than subspace of W, right? Yeah, uh, yeah so, sorry. This, this map is, is by the pair AB. Yes, this is the, yeah, right, exactly. Sorry, this is the image of A, and maybe A of V and B of V would be a better way. But, but yes, they're transverse. And so that's the same, same as this condition here. Thanks. Um, let's look at this condition. What is the extra choice of VI prime? It's just this uh, one dimensional choice. Had I not put this condition, these two lines could be any two lines, and I would have had an extra p1. So this space here is, a, is an a1, or c, p1 minus point uh, bundle over, over, over one of these, let's say, on the left. So each time you cross, you add to your moduli space an extra line. 
and the moduli space comes together with a natural partial compactification where you forget this, this uh, inequality. Vi and Vi, Vi is distinct from Vi uh, prime. OK, so maybe write something down. So suppose you have a braid, which is a bunch of crossings. I, d I don't know. Could be anything. Something like that. Um, then you, at each, you, you, you form this, uh, these local moduli spaces. If, if B is SI1 through SIK. You form these moduli spaces, but they have to agree on the overlaps. And so is a fiber product over the flags at each overlap. Okay. First overlap, second overlap, third overlap, and so on. OK. So that's now a local picture of this moduli space across a, a whole braid. And now I might have to. Glue it to, I want to glue it together on the cylindrical geometry. So we have um, the moduli space for the braid closure uh, is going to be, I can glue it together by choosing an element of the group, GLN, to glue the left-hand side to the right-hand side. Um, but there's a little bit, I guess, it, uh, there's some compatibility condition, which I'll discuss in this uh, example. All right, so that got a little bit out of hand. Let me do an example to show you what I mean. Let's look at oh, modular space of one strand, but glued together at the end. I guess I wrote it with a bar on top here, but that didn't look good if I wrote a bar with another bar on top. So I'll write it this way. So here's the picture. We have 0 here. We have a line um, uh, here. Oh, let's do, something, let's do something better. Doesn't matter how many I have, so I might as well do more. So I have a flag. That's the moduli space originally was a space of flags. But because I have a local system, I can have an action of G relating the right-hand side to the, right, the left-hand side. So it's a, it's a set of pairs, flag G. But these flags have to match, meaning that um, GF equals F. Okay. So that's the set of pairs, flag element of the group, uh, such that the flag is fixed by the group element. This is sometimes written G twiddle in Springer theory. It's the simultaneous resolution of the group. Okay. And there's an action of the group here. Um, I can change my basis. So action of G. Sending a flag uh, goes to HF, and the group element goes to H, G, H, F. OK, so if you didn't follow all that, what's, what's the point? You, you, you uh, impose this condition that uh, along the link, you get a rank one local system, and you ask, how, what are all the objects that have that condition? The answer is some moduli space of objects. We constructed that moduli space by analyzing it locally in slices. It looks like a flag variety locally. Or, or, or along crossings, it looks like pairs of flags with some transversality condition. And uh, it's essentially one flag plus a complex number. You do that. In, a lot. You glue it together by an element of the group. 
preserving the flags at the left and the right, and you get this moduli space. Um, no, no, I mean, uh, knowing the flag means you know the eigenlines, but you don't necessarily know the eigenvalues. So. Yeah. OK. So there's a natural uh, com partial compactification where you just forget this uh, transverse condition, and you just take any two flags. right? No conditions. No conditions at the crossing. Then, in fact, the additional data at, across each crossing is, is actually an element of P1. There's no, no condition on, the, on this other line in C2 related to that line. Okay? So that gives you a natural compactification or partial compactification, which compactifies M into, I'll call it M bar, okay? where we ignore the crossing condition. The reason why it wasn't a, some kind of quiver, quiver with relations category because, was precisely because of this crossing condition. There was an inequality among uh, the arrows of the quiver rather than equality. And that's kind of a weird thing. I don't know if maybe people know more than I do know about that kind of thing. Uh, if you ignore that, ignore that crossing condition and look at that moduli space, you get this uh, partial compactification. OK. Um, where, does the poly, where do the polynomials come out? It would probably be a little bit um, disappointed. We have to plug into another, uh, another um, machine constructed by Ben Webster and Jordy Williamson, who basically take this space, uh, or, or a space that's very related, a uh, kind of a Schubert variety, the kinds of things that Sergel originally studied to construct his bimodules and what Kovanov used and kovanov rosansky used to construct their knot invariants. Anyway, they go back to the geometry of these uh, Schubert varieties. And from that, they're able to also construct invariants, which are equivalent. And so their work is equivalent to, for in our case, to studying the Larey spectral sequence um, of this inclusion. Um, Lorais, uh, encodes, this Lorais spectral sequence encodes the full three variable, I shouldn't say three variable, uh, three of maybe four or more variables, uh, 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 not invariant. Okay, I'll, be a little, I'll give you a little more details than that. The point is, it's all in that moduli space, which is, to us, you know, maybe just a piece of this category. I don't know what else is in this category. All right, so let me. Uh, so at the E two term of a Lorais spectral sequence, uh, you have the cohomology of this base with fibers in the cohomology push forward. Um, this has a differential. Let me say a little one more thing before I um, before I move on. What's the difference between m bar and m? It's precisely the point in this P one where the two lines align. Okay, so that's a point in P one. That's a divisor. So the difference between m bar and m is a divisor. Uh, it's a multi-component divisor because it happens at every crossing. And those divisors intersect each other. And um, that divisor basically says, well, what does it say? It says that those two, these two lines are the same. It's a lot like uncrossing. And the whole procedure of Analyzing that un those uh, simultaneous uncrossings is basically the procedure for constructing the knot invariant. And the point is that that divisor is precisely this differential in this, se in this spectral sequence. It's got a, um, it's got a, it's got a, um, it's got a what, bump form in, on its normal, uh, in its normal directions, and that actually determines this differential. 
OK, so if you take the cohomology of that differential and take its uh, Poincare polynomial, I guess if you take the cohomology and then take this Poincare polynomial, you're actually doing the E3 page. This is the not invariant. You actually, do, so it's just the start, just the third page, or second page if you want to take homology before take your Poincare polynomial of, of a spectral sequence. But you don't want to take the spectral sequence any further. It's a little bit of uh, what we heard in Mohammed Abu Zaid's talk earlier. Um, there might be a difference between two. Well, in his, in, I guess in, in his case, the spectral sequence did um, degenerate, and they had an equivalence of, of theories. But this one we want only at E3. At, at E infinity, it's not as interesting. All right, sorry. So um, for example, we could take just the one component unknot where we have this. Our group is GL1, which is the same as um, it's uh, abelian. It's the same as it's Borel. It's the same as it's torus. In this case, there's no crossings. So our M is the same as our M bar. And there's very little to do on the, with that sequence. It's just uh, this is just C. So this is just the cohomology. Oh, sorry. A, this is just the equivariant cohomology. So our. Uh, Spectral sequence is uh, the equivariant, T equivariant cohomology of M, which is just T itself. It's just a choice of an element of the group. How you're going to glue C to C, you have to choose an element of C star. C star. OK, but this is equivariant cohomology of T acting trivially on itself. So that splits like this tensor product. And the equivariant cohomology of T is polynomial ring. Equivariant, the ordinary cohomology of a torus is a ring in, of a nilpotent element. And uh, what's the Poincare polynomial? Uh, this is uh, 1 minus A over 1 plus q plus q squared plus so on, 1 minus q. So that looks like Homphy of, a, of an unknot. But you don't see the third grading because this spectral sequence doesn't have, so the three gradings are p, q, and uh, the equivariant cohomology of g, to answer your question. And they're essentially the three uh, variables, but there could be a, some linear transformation. If G is what? Higher rank. If G is of higher rank, then uh, you're going to have more. Gen it's, I think it's only the total degree in the equivariant cohomology which, which contributes. So I'd, they somehow mix up among the, the tori. So what's the, the other variables? The other ones are the other two uh, variables. No, no, I mean, the other in G. I don't know. I don't know. Sorry. OK. That's the application. Good. I'm glad I did it, because it took most of the talk. Um, all right. So now maybe I can give you motivation, or if there are any other questions. We can. A number of strands. So, uh, sorry if I didn't say it, because that's, that's the length of that flag. It's not the number of components, the number of strands. Yeah. All right, I've lost. OK, I don't know what, uh, let's see what, do some time management for the remaining stuff. I don't know what's most interesting to you. you could, we, I could show you right in my stir, but um, maybe, maybe I'll back up a bit. Backing up. So where did this construction come from? It came from the following. We're looking, let's say, in the cotangent bundle of a 
of a base manifold. I'm drawing the picture where x is equal to s1. Is the cotangent of s1. Uh, and um, at infinity, this is a contact uh, manifold. And if I want to construct a Legendrian invariant, I need a Legendrian subspace of infinity. And the reason I started studying these kinds of things is because I'm interested in the Fukai category of that cotangent bundle. And in certain nice cases, such a Fukai category is described in terms of locally constant sheaves. So to go from infinity to something finite, and uh, I want to also go, to, uh, sorry, to go from just the structure at infinity to some sort of structure which is Lagrangian that I can address through a Fukai category and its relation to locally constant sheaves, I can take uh, the cone over the Lagrange, over the Lagrangian. So here's infinity. Here's a here's a here's a little lambda, a point inside lambda inside infinity. The cone over that would look like this. And let me put, let me throw in the zero section as well. So that's this. Okay. So this picture here, the union of the zero section with the cotangent fiber, is a lambda. And we have a relationship in uh, previous work with David Nadler, which allows us to think about this Fukai category, in this unwrapped Fukai category, for, or for, ex for those who know, in terms of locally constant sheaves just on the base manifold. That's part of the general mantra that the symplectic topology of the cotangent should be the topology of the base. And this is a realization of that mantra in the case of cotangents. So if we're interested in something Legendrian that's happening at infinity, we want to somehow remove the compact part and the way we do that is to quotient this category. By the, the denominator there is just local systems on the base manifold. This has to do with singular support of locally constant sheaves, uh, but I don't think I'm going to discuss that here. Uh, it's a subject I like to discuss, but um, it's a subject which I can't convey to you in a short amount of time. I don't know. This is the only thing I know how to do. Um, so in these examples here, we can actually just think of uh, compactly supported sheaves on x with values in lambda. <coughs> well, actually, I should say it's maybe not as simple in the cylindrical case, but in the R in the R R two uh, case, it is. Now, so that's the first. That's an attempt at a category. That's the category that, I mean, that attempt is 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 correct, and uh, work of Guillermo. Kashiwara and Shapira, the whole study of singular support of uh, sheaves is due to Kashiwara and Shapira. Um, their result proves that, see, that this category is, is a Legendrian uh, uh, isotopy uh, invariant. Okay, so it does the trick. One. All right. Forget it. Um, anyway, so yeah, right. And so that's our category. And it's an uh, invariant. And there is, I can show you uh, local uh, versions of why it's invariant by showing you how it's invariant under right Meister moves. But there's no point in doing that in one minute. Uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't tell you anything that you don't already know from this theorem. Um, OK, great. Legendrian category, not invariants. Thanks. <laughs> Nikita. Is the notion of stable objects in the category? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I don't have a guarantee that, uh, no, ma that no matter what uh, condition you put on the objects, uh, 
that you're going to have a nice moduli spaces. But for the ones, for this rank one conditions, for these braid closures, we do have nice ones. So in general, the moduli spaces could be a little bit nastier. Oh, but there's, there's another answer. The, the notion of stability condition is uh, there's a really interesting relationship between objects of our categories and um, their harder Narasimhan filtrations and uh, rulings of Legendrian submanifolds and fillings. And I should say that there's a relation between these moduli spaces and the spaces that uh, these augmentation varieties that Mina, uh, Mina Aganagic was talking about. And yeah, thanks for the question. <laughs> to allow me to, to mention that. Other question? Is it high dimensional? Higher dimensional. Yeah, so this is all, high, this is all completely general, general. And if you take in some examples where, uh, uh, in some examples, uh, this, is, this lambda is actually this, the skeleton of the large volume limit that appears in mirror symmetry. And this category is conjecturally the uh, Kinsevich's uh, sheaf of uh, A infinity categories that lives on the skeleton, something that he wanted to build. And conjecturally, this is the answer to that question. That's another story. But other questions? All right. Thanks. Oh, thank you.